Today we're talking about one of the omnis, right? Uh, and we're going to talk about three different omnis. I'm not sure how long we're going to take. I know I will definitely not get done with this one today, Miss Tony, because I can either get done with it today and we never have lunch, or I'm going to make this a two-part thing. So today we're talking about uh, the omnipotence of God, omnipotence. Come on, just say that to your neighbor, Hope. Just say omnipotence. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah, it's a big word, but it's actually in the Bible. And I think we should, as Christians, know some of these words in the language of Scripture um, and to get an understanding. And the big idea is that we're actually learning about things that tribute to God, to attribute to God, a characteristic of God. And this is a big one. This is an important one. And so I want us to start in Revelation 19. It's actually where the Bible ends, uh, but it's a good place place for us to begin. I want to start reading, if I can, in verse 1. I'm going to be reading the KJV just in this verse because it uses that language. It uses that word. It may not be in your um, translation of the Bible, but it's okay because it still points to the definition of where we're going today, okay? So Revelation, and as I read this, I know sometimes as a non-denominational church, we kind of come in a little laxed, and, uh, but I want you to read it today almost like a Presbyterian or a Lutheran. And what I mean by that is we're going to read it with some reverence this morning, all right? We're going to read it uh, with some, some kind of honor, some respect. We're going to kind of come to this holy text and really, really think like use our intellect to really think about some of these, these big dramatic things that are happening in this text because there's a lot going on, all right? So I don't want to just kind of read through it sometimes, how we read through scriptures, or we're very off the cuff here. Um, and that's good too. I love that about our church. But, but there is an elegance and a, and a gravity to this text that I really want us to honor God with as I read it for you and as you read it along with me. Let's look at verse 1. After these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and had avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and they worshiped God. They sat on the throne saying, Amen. Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and all ye who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and the voice of many waters, and the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God, omnipotent, reigneth. A lot going on in this vision that John has. And in this vision, it's painting this picture of creation standing before an omnipotent, almighty, that's where we get the word El Shaddai from, God. And they're standing in awe, singing a song, hallelujah, and making these bold statements about who this God is that they worshiped and how things have happened here on this earth that have come against God's people. But now they're standing victoriously before God to proclaim his omnipotence. Now I get really excited about that, Tony, but I also understand the definition of the word. My hope today is to teach you what it is for God to be omnipotent. All right? It's in your notes, so if you've already looked at the notes, you already got the cheat code. You already know where I'm going, but 
But let's really dive into this concept again, not in just language of defining words, but to really consider this morning this attribute of God. Because that's my desire for us is many times, even in Christian circles, even on Sunday mornings when we gather, we read scripture and we make scripture to depict who we are. And we make scripture to depict about what our will is and what our desires are and what our plans are. But scripture is actually pointing to God and his character. And as we study this, as we've been now studying several characteristics of God, we've talked about how God is gracious and what that means. We talked about how he is merciful. And then we spent the past three weeks talking about how he is holy which his holiness actually like runs through all of his other attributes. Well, today there's another major attribute of God and it is that he is omnipotent. So let's break this thing down in the Latin, okay? So omni meaning all, all right? So as we talk about the three different omnis, it means all. And then the second word is potent, which means powerful. So it's a very simple definition then to this word. Omnipotent is to be all powerful. All right? We good? All right, let's go home. Let's pray. I'm just kidding. No, wouldn't wouldn't that be great? Like we could just end it there if we just all got that concept. Now let's dive a little bit deeper if we can, because I think it's important for us to define this. In fact, as I was praying and studying, really just marveling at how our God is all powerful, there are some kind of roadblocks that come in the way that I do want to answer this morning and how we biblically define omnipotent. Because a general definition of omnipotence is all powerful. Powerful, But let's give a more deeper biblical definition. What does omnipotence have to do with God? All right? So here's what I've written down as a working definition of God's omnipotence. It means that God has power over all things. And I even like put in parentheses what that means in all things. In all things, what I'm saying is that is beings, whether human beings, spiritual beings, whatever it is, Beings over processes. There's a power struggle sometimes that goes on in our world. He's like over all the processes of of nature and, and what we're even about to see in creation coming out of summer into fall. He's over all of those processes, even processes of, of laws of gravity and other laws that we have. He is he is powerful over all of those processes. And then lastly, he is he is powerful over all objects. All things in existence, he is powerful over. Now, let's think about that for a second. Because, like, I know some strong people, Adam, Tyler. I know some strong people in my life. I've watched, you know, competitions on ESPN when football's not on. Thank, Thank the Lord it's back on. But when you're watching, like, lumberjacks throw trees and stuff, during the summer months and you're like, man, I can't wait for college football to start back up. But I've seen some big dudes like cut down a huge log in five seconds and, and then chunk it a thousand yards, you know, like, and, and, and even in our own concept, I, I think fathers, when you look at your sons, like, what do you consider to be powerful? What things are you treat, are teaching them about power and strength? Mothers, your daughters, like, what does it mean for them to be a strong woman? Does it just mean it's so interesting to me that, that we, we kind of put people in these different categories of what we think strength is, and, and we immediately equate it to, like, muscles, you know? Like, just put on a tight shirt. Let me just see with the skies out, right? Like, the, the sun's out. So that means it's an opportunity for me put my guns out, right? And we immediately equate that to like our physical strength, but but to consider an omnipotent God, an infinite God and all of his power and all of his strength. Is it even something that we can comprehend, Pastor Devin? I don't know. I mean, we will try our best this morning to see if we we can dive a little bit deeper, but but to really think on God is all powerful over all things in 
existence. That is our God. I'm going to give you another definition. And I think this is helpful because of one of the roadblocks that can come into finding omnipotence. And maybe you've already dealt with this or you've studied this even in apologetics. But, but some would define omnipotence as can do anything. And I think we should be careful about that definition because that definition needs a lot of context. So, so, so if we say that God is all powerful, which is looking at the root word, that's what it means. It means that God is all powerful. If he can do anything, it comes with a context. It comes with a context. Let me, let me, let me explain this to you. There is a thing called the omnipotence paradox. In other words, it's something that if somebody were to come up to you and say, well, if you believe that omnipotence is just that God can do anything, can God create a boulder that he can't lift? Or, or, or let me dive a little bit deeper. Can God sin? Zach, can he? No, he can't. So, so some would say, then, then that's a contradiction. Then God can then not be omnipotent. Because there are certain things that God can't do. Did, did you know that God even limits himself in his power and how he operates? That he would create human beings and give them authority and allow, allow them to subdue it? Allow the, do you think God needed that? No. But he allows us, like God could have came down with Adam as he was naming all the animals, which is what God told Adam to do. And God could have done that. But why does he do that? Think about even Jesus. Jesus was hungry. Jesus, he sweated. He cried. He felt pain. And, and, and so to just, to just define omnipotence of God, meaning, you know, he can do anything. Be careful because that may trap you. So, so if we are going to, to add that to the definition, let me give some context with that definition. All right, I've got it in your notes. If God can do anything... It must be in agreement with his holy character. Because God's not going to sin. God's not going to do that. And so because what we learned for the past three weeks, God's holy character. See, this is why it's so important to learn these attributes. Because many times in our world and our concepts and what we think about different characteristics of people, when we look at the thing called grace, and grace is goodness, right? It's, it's, it's undeserved goodness. We may have earthly examples of seeing grace in somebody else's life where we're like, oh, that's a gracious person. Oh, that's a loving person. What happens when that person fails? There needs to be an internal, infinite example that we can turn to that says in all things he is good. In all things he is loving. In all things he is powerful. What, are the, what, what is the motivation behind those things that God does? It's his holiness. See, this is why these two things tie together so greatly. In understanding that God is holy and understanding that God is right in all things, it helps me to be able to find comfort in knowing that he's a powerful God because he's also holy. And it's just like the uncle told young Spider-Man, with great power comes what? Great responsibility. So if God has all the power, all week as I've been studying this, it's been a 90s song in my brain. I got the power. I don't know why. So I just hope it gets stuck in your brain, Hope. Just every day, just all the time. Just, I got the power. All right? If there's anything that you take away from this message, you can take that with you. And as we think about the power of God, he does have power. And thank God that that power is rooted in his holy character. And so, yes. In doing anything, it will align and connect to his holiness. But he is ultimately all-powerful. If you were to look at Genesis chapter 1, you can turn there if you want to. Genesis chapter 1. And you see the story of creation is really the first example of his holiness and his power. That he would create. And in the story of creation, you see all of these let there be and to let. And, and how does God let things happen? All right. As he is creating, the Bible says this, if you look in verse three, 
Here's how he's letting these things happen. And God said, that's how powerful God is. God said, let there be light. You can drop down to verse six and you'll see another example. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. And he separates the waters and land. And you could continue to read down into verse 9. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together and let there be dry land. You could look down to verse 11 and see again where it says, and God said, let the earth sprout vegetation and plants and fruit. Then you could drop down to verses 14 and 15. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day and the night. And then in verse 15, and let let them lights in the expanse of heavens uh, to give light upon the earth, and it was so. In verse 20, you see, and God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly. In verse 24, you see, and God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds. And then in verse 26, he says, Let us make man in our own image, in our likeness. In the very beginning of our story, it's not the beginning of God's story, God's eternal. Maybe that's something we'll talk about. But in the beginning of our story, God creates, and he he doesn't need an excavator or a bulldozer or lumber, which is really expensive, He doesn't need a construction team or an architect. He just speaks. And some people are like, well, that's just too simplistic in just making that statement. But if anything, I I don't find that statement simplistic. I I find it captivating. (laughs) I find it mesmerizing to to, to think that God could, there's there's a Latin word that people use in seminary called ex nihilo, and it means to create out of nothing. Like when, if I'm building, I don't build Legos with my kids anymore, but, but I couldn't build any, any Lego stuff with them if, if I didn't have substance, if I didn't have something to build with. That's true for any of us. But with God, he can create out of nothing. That's power. That's power. That he can just speak and it happens. In Numbers chapter 11, verse 23, the Lord reminds Moses, we get a little bit deeper into our story. He reminds Moses, who's struggling with the nation of Israel, he says, as the Lord's hand shortened, now you shall see whether my word will come true for you or not. God is so powerful that we can put his word, if his word is that powerful to just speak into existence, then that means that we can put his word to the test. And even God is challenging Moses here. He says, hey, you want to see? You want to see if I'm faithful? You want to see if I'm all powerful? Let's just wait and see what happens then. God is faithful. See, this is the one thing that should encourage us as Christians. When we pray to pray scripture, Because when we pray scripture, we're not praying on our own authority. We're not praying on our own word. We're praying on the word of God. And when we pray God's word, we can just sit back and just say, all right, is God's hand shortened? Can he not do this? Or will this come to pass? God will be faithful in every instance. He is faithful to his word. He is faithful to his word. In Job chapter 42, and Job had a difficult life, but but Job makes this declaration even with everything that Job has experienced, with the loss, with the trauma, with the, with the drama, like with everything that Job experienced, he makes this declaration. He says, I know that you, God, can do all things and that no purpose of yours is thwarted. No purpose of yours will stop. No purpose of yours can anyone change or void or get rid of. You will do what you will do. He had come 
to his senses and to his heart to make this declaration just as we as God's people, as we look to an omnipotent God, realize that we are at his mercy and we are at his grace and thank God that he is holy and thank God that he sent a holy Jesus to mediate for us in order that we could be in relationship with him and he is powerful and he can do all things. Like all of these attributes that we're learning about God help us to to look to him and to praise him and to sing songs. And like even when we sing that last verse of that one song, what a powerful name it is. See, I don't know if any of you have ever got caught up in spiritual warfare before, but there are times in the middle of the night, I've woken up at 2, 3 a.m. in the morning and I have to go into my living room and people are like, how do you fight spiritual warfare? I tell you one way to fight it, just start speaking the name of Jesus. I mean, I'll get into my living room and just start reading the Bible and putting on some worship music. I, I love that Zadora, I know she's not here today, but Zadora last week when she got baptized, she was tell, telling us testimony. You remember? Her son was in the hospital, had fevers, was having seizures, and, and things were going bad. And you know what she did in the room? She filled that room full of Jesus' name. She began to read scripture. She began to listen to worship. If we would fill the room with the name of Jesus, it is a powerful name. Demons tremble at his name. The problem is sometimes when we get in a sticky situation and we start realizing that our finances can't cover it, that our strength is not going to be able to handle it, we're like, we start panicking. And it's good for you to recognize that you're not strong. But the thing that God wants you to do is he doesn't want you to stay in that weakness. He doesn't want you to just be little and small and just be like, well, I'll just martyr. I'm just going to live as a martyr and I'll just never be good enough. No, it's that so you can recognize that he is all powerful, that he is the one that changes things, that his word changes things. And I have to lean into that in my faith, in my faith. And so I know that you can do all things, God. I'm so thankful that we have Romans 13 in a over-politicalized culture, in a dividing culture, we divide on silly things. And I'm grateful for Romans 13 because Paul even says that he talks about different governing authorities. <laughs> You're like, what about those kind of powers? How do, we, how do we deal with those kind of powers, God? In Romans 13, verse 1, he says this. He says, let every person be subject to governing authorities. He says, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Have you ever thought that instead of rumbling and complaining that maybe God knows something that you don't? Maybe God is working something out for the good. You're like, yeah, but I didn't vote for that guy. Yeah, I didn't vote for that person. Yeah, I don't like that. Like, listen, but maybe God is all authority, is all power, and is working something out at his perfect will and plan. Maybe. Or maybe we just need to put a more powerful person in office. Maybe we just need to be more powerful. No. No. It's trusting in the fact that even though my world around, do you know when Paul is writing some of these letters? It's when King Nero is the authority. Man, you think, we, you, you, think you didn't like the president a couple years ago or you don't like the president now. King Nero burned down his whole city and blamed the Christians for it. King Nero like killed a bunch of Christians, used them as tiki torches. Did a bunch of other kind of crazy stuff. There's, there, I, I see Jada's face. I'm not going to go any more, any more detail. You can teach her church history later, Miss Tony. <laughs> Did some like wild stuff. That guy was off the chain. And, and, and Paul is writing this saying, be subject to them because I trust in this fact that God is all authority. Yeah, God may be allowing some stuff to happen right now, but I'm going to trust that God is all powerful. Even with King Nebuchadnezzar, in the Old Testament with the three Hebrew boys. God didn't change the authority. The authority was a wicked king. But God, in the midst of a burnery, burning, fiery furnace, protected those three boys. God, God will do what he needs to do for his glory, to show forth his power. He's been faithful. 
But this morning, I want us to, you can turn to John chapter 20 is where we'll end today. But, but while you're turning to John chapter 20, I'm actually going to read through the entire book of John this morning. I'm going to skim it. <laughs> because as I was thinking about the power of God, here's what the Holy Spirit put on me to share with you today. All right, we, we've got some type of context now of the um, omnipotence of God. And we'll talk more about it next week or the week after. We'll talk as long as we need to about it. But we've got some type of working definition and, and even some concepts in creation and with Moses and with Job. But, but I felt like today the Holy Spirit would have me to talk to you about Jesus' miracles. Because I think there's a misconception even recognizing God's power in the why. I think it's important for us to know why God does a lot of things that he does. And God's not keeping it a secret. When God shows forth his power, he's not keeping, us, keeping it a secret. And so even though you may be in John chapter 20, if you were to look all the way in John chapter 1, you'll see creation. You'll see the same opening line statement like you find in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning was the word, logos. That is God. And it says, and the word was with God and the word was God. Some confusing terminologies there trying to explain the Godhead. But what, he was, what he's going to ultimately get to is tell us who the word is. He's going to tell us in verse 14. He says, and he was in the beginning with God and all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. And in him was life. And the life was the light of men, and that light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And in verse 14, it tells us that this is God sending Jesus, or God becoming incarnate in, in the flesh. Verse 14 says, and that word became flesh and dwelt among us. You know who that is? That's Jesus. He says, and as he dwells among us, he says, we see his glory. I've taught you this many times, but I don't, I don't ever want it to slip from you of, of what glory means. Glory is, is, a, is, a, is a weight metric to show value. To show value. Uh, when I, we went on a youth trip, Zach, you remember when we went to the mountains in North Carolina? Well, we did. Oh, you didn't go to that one? Okay. Uh, well, we went on a youth trip and um, to the mountains, and we took some of our youth. And, and I wasn't a youth leader. I was just there, I think, just to teach. And uh, we're up in the mountains, and I don't know. I think they were eating beanie weenies or something for lunch. And I was like, bump this. I saw Ingalls at the bottom of the hill of the mountain. I'm going to go eat lunch there because you know what? I deserve it. I'm going to treat myself. <laughs> so I went down to Ingalls, and Ingalls has got like an olive bar. Like, I mean, they got all kind of good stuff. They got like this huge salad bar. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to get me a big old salad. A big old, you know what a big old salad is? Not a healthy one, right? And so, you know, I got all this lettuce and cheese and meat and eggs and ranch dressing and all of this good stuff and croutons. And, and you know what? That salad was valued by how much it weighed, Right? Right? Like, like it, they didn't just say, hey, salads are $7.49. Because you know why? Because dudes, big dudes like me walk in and we see how much we can cram into that plastic container. And so here's what they do is that you take that container that you filled with salad stuff and you bring it to the counter and they got this little measuring device that you put that salad on. And based on the weight of that salad is the based on the price that you pay. Needless to say, I paid probably $14, $15 for a salad. It was a big one. God's glory is a weightiness in which we measure his greatness. And in verse 14, what, what the scriptures are trying to depict to us is an understanding that when Jesus came, it gave us a, a tangible opportunity to see the value of God to see how awesome God is, to see how 
powerful God is. In fact, he lives a sinless, holy life here on earth as an example for us to look at. And so in John chapter 1, he's letting us know that Jesus was in creation because Jesus is eternal. So he's already spoken into creation. Now he comes down with his creation and he starts doing these amazing, miraculous things. In John chapter 2, guess what he does? It's his first miracle. He turns water into wine. Turns water into wine. And then if you were to continue on in John chapter 5, you would see that he heals a man at this poolside in Bethesda. People are amazed, and he picks up his mat, and he says, okay, go, get out of here. You're healed. In John chapter 6, you see that he feeds over 5,000-plus people in one sitting with just like a couple of fish and loaves. He feeds all these people miraculously. Also in that same chapter, when they leave town, he walks on water. In John chapter 9... He heals a man who had been born blind. And the disciples are like, why was he born blind? Did his parents sin? Did he sin? He said, no. He said, this is just to show people my glory. This is to show people my value. This is to show people that I can do all things according to my holiness. And I'm all powerful. And that when I line things up in people's life, oh, people may look at this man of like, oh, he messed up or all things. Oh, he, he, got, he got the bad end of the stick, right? Like he's, he's really struggling, but, but this is going to change his life forever because he's going to have an encounter with a powerful God. It, it's interesting to me, even last week hearing the story, it was so amazing seeing Mr. Rick come here. And for those who don't know, that is a feat for him to be here in this room with us. And I've listened to that man ever since I've known him because I've only known him post strokes. He's had two strokes. And you know what that man does? That man praises God for them strokes. You know why? Because it got his attention. What? He said, I I was a hard-headed man. He said, I used to ride motorcycles and play golf all the time. My wife used to invite me to church all the time. And I just never go. I ain't caring about none of that stuff until God put me down on my face. (laughs) He got my attention then. And some people are like, yeah, but that doesn't make you mad at God. Like, why would God, that sounds like God's being mean. No, it's just that God used these finite things that we can see here on this earth sometimes to get our attention. Now, how we respond, yeah, that's on you and I. And and Rick chose to to respond with praise. To say, God, I I see you working even in this, that you have my attention. You see, God is, is doing all of these things, trying to get people's attention. In John chapter 11, we see another story, like he raises his friend Lazarus from the dead. This is amazing. And some people are like, man, you were three days late, though. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? Like Jesus shows up. He's so powerful. But Jesus, you didn't do it on my timeline, though. I, I, think it, I think it's meant to teach us something. God, he doesn't work on our timeline. We're, we're not omnipotent. We're not the holy one. We're not the gracious one. We're not the merciful one. He is. And if Jesus were to show up in the room, and like, would we recognize and be submitted to, to what he wants to do? So he shows up and he, he resurrects his friend. And then ultimately in, in John chapter 20, He resurrects from the dead. He's put on a cross, which his disciples didn't understand as well. They're like, why why are you going to, you can't die. Because again, they're thinking in context of power. If you're all powerful, then let's overthrow Rome. Let's just trash the current governmental system and let's just rebuild this kingdom right now. And then they keep asking Jesus, who's the greatest? We talked about this last week. Who's the greatest? I won't be the greatest. Jesus is like, no, that's not what I came to do. I came to die on a cross. He resurrects three days later in John chapter 20. And I tell you all this story. There's a lot of other, there's a lot of other miracles. In fact, in, in John chapter 21, look at John 21, 25. He says, now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Now, this is just John's depiction of Jesus' miracles. If you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you'll see even more stories and miracles and power that Jesus has. He says, but 
He says if they were to, to literally jot down and write down every one of them, he says, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. That's a lot of power. I got the power. That's a lot of power, y'all. That's a lot. He said, not even the books of the world could contain all the things and the power that Jesus has. Why, though? Why? Why is that? What is Jesus trying to accomplish in that power, in his omnipotence? This is what I want us to leave with this morning. All right? This is the key in understanding the why behind an all-powerful God. Go back to John chapter 20. Don't miss this. John chapter 20, look at verse 30 and 31. It says this. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, here it is, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that by that belief, by that faith, in an all-powerful God, you may have a life in his name. You may have known that already, but maybe you didn't. I think it's a paradigm shift in the concept of God's characteristics of why he does things and why he is the way that he is. Again, not correlating these attributes to earthly understandings of interactions that we have with other people, but that we see clearly because what God's word says of why would he be gracious and why would he be merciful and why would he be holy and why would he be omnipotent? The reason for God's omnipotence is to catch our attention to show us that he is who he says he is. If we can't trust in his omnipotence, then what does the other things matter? If we can't trust that he's holier than anyone else, then what, is it, what, what does morality mean? If we can't trust in his grace and his goodness, then what is the good news, right? Like he is the standard. And even... People on earth, they still didn't even get it. If you were to go over to Acts chapter 2 and verse 22, Peter's preaching a message at the day of Pentecost. He said, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested. He's been put to the test. He's been proven. He's, he's been shown. You know him. You know what he's done. He's been attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. He says, this is a testament. You saw the works. You saw the wonders. You saw the signs. You saw the power. He said he did this to show you who he was. That he is God. So listen to me very carefully because this is the statement that I want us to leave with this morning. The miracles of Jesus weren't performed that so people could experience some cool thing. These things, this power, it happened in order that we and they would recognize and believe his power, his omnipotence. That's why he did it. Let me tell you how that statement correlates with a lot of other aspects of our life. Because it is with my life right now and my struggle for contentment. My struggle for contentment in a season of rest. And my flesh wants to tell me that when our church is larger in numbers, then I'll find joy. When, when we create the program or the method or the thing that we're supposed to be doing, then I'll be happy. That's for me, I'm a pastor. You may be thinking about it in your work. You're like, you know what, if we were just, if we just hired two more people, everything would be better. And so that's where your joy is found. If you just think, like, there are some people that think, like, like some single people here, like, you, you think, like, when, when I get married, oh, praise God, I'll be happy. Or maybe you're married and you think, when, when, when we have a baby, oh, man, I'm going to tell you what, a baby helps everything may be better. All the chuckles are parents. 
in the room. You, you may be thinking like, when I start making X amount of money, oh man, things are going to get a lot better then. I've learned in the past that you can make this amount or that amount and it's never enough. I'm telling you this because I fear it's not just me in the room that keeps looking towards the thing for our fulfillment and our joy. I'm telling you this this morning because whatever that thing is for you, it, it's never going to bring you contentment. It's never going to be your joy. Just like, man, I feel this in the spirit. This is why God wanted me to share with you the miracles of Jesus. This is why he wanted me to study. Because he wants my attention. Do, do you know the rest of the story when Jesus feeds the 5,000 plus? He feeds them to their full and there's leftovers. And you know what they wanted from him later? More food. The miracle wasn't enough. The power of what the power does is not supposed to be the thing that we put our faith in, but the thing and the source where the power comes from. Oh, are you getting this? This changes our concept of an omnipotent God. Man, I'm, I'm preaching this message even online for those that may be watching online or may be watching this message 20 years later, that, that this story of, of what God's power does is in order that we might put our faith in where the power comes from. Where the power comes from. Can I just share even a personal thing for me? Ezekiel is one of my favorite. There's a chapter in Ezekiel that's one of my pocket messages. I've preached it in a lot of churches. You know what a pocket message is? You know what a pocket message is? It's, it's a message that every pastor's got that they can just throw out and they can preach it. It's a good message. It's what you want to preach at the conference. It's what you want to preach at the revival. And I got one in Ezekiel. It's called the healing waters of Jesus. It's where a man has a dream. And in that dream, God leads him out to some waters and they bring him down to his feet. And I'm here to tell you today that when you get in the water, that's your salvation. And we all got to get in. And then he took him a little bit further and he brought him down to his knees. <laughs> and that's your prayer life. You need to get a prayer. And then he brought him out to his waist. And that's where your loins need to be girded about with truth. And then he brought him out into waters that could not be passed, waters to swim in. And that's where we dig a little bit deep in our faith. And I preached that message. Boy, I could, pre I could preach that message. And here's something God revealed to me here recently. Jared it's cool about the waters because the waters end up telling the story of how they go out and they bring life to everything. Oh, man. It's an encouraging message. It, it heals the land. Everything that that water touches, it heals the land. And I'm sitting here preaching this message about how if I just get in the water and if I just have a better prayer life and if I just gird up my loins, oh, Holy Spirit, help me. And the thing that God got my attention about Jared, where did the water come from? It came from the temple, which is a picture of God. I've gotten so far ahead of myself that I'm sitting here wanting to see all the mighty works that I forgot who was mighty. Lord, forgive me. Forgive me when I have sought the gift more than the gift giver. Lord, forgive me when I have sought what the power can do instead of seek a powerful God, I've missed the mark. And I'm grateful for his grace to tell me to slow down and just read the story again. I know this is what you think you see, but read it again to see what I want you to see. Friends, I'm, I'm here to tell you today, like God wants our attention. The miracles and the power, they can do some cool things. But God is wanting us to look to him this morning. He's wanting us to see him for all that he is and all that he's done. Because he is more powerful than what you think. He is omnipotent. He is omnipotent. And may he catch our attention this morning. May he slow us down from trying to get to the thing and just focus on him. 
Just focus on him. If you're looking for some ways to maybe grow in your faith and to take this into more of a practical way, I want to leave you this morning with some what we've been calling discipleship homework. Because I can preach sometimes, and I try not to do this, I really am not, sometimes preach in a preachy language with preachy things up here. And people are like, well, that's cool on Sundays, but what do I do with that when my kids are screaming in my ear? What do I do with that with my busy schedule at work? What do I do with that when my finances are struggling? And and, and I just, I want to give you something that you can just take this week that God may just get your attention. And so here's what I put in the discipleship homework notes for you. Because I want you to ask the question, how can you know that God is omnipotent? I read you stories about Jesus' miracles that happened a long time ago. I read you stories in the Old Testament, but how can, how can Ryan know this week that God is all-powerful? How can Brianna know that God is all-powerful? How can I know that God is all I think God's not afraid of that. I think we should ponder and sit on that question this week. God, how can I know that you're all powerful? How can I look to you as the source? So I want you to spend some time reflecting on the miraculous works and power of God in your life. Or maybe even in someone around you. I told Katie this past week, There's a difference in the pastor I used to be and the pastor I feel like I am today. And I pray that there always is. I want to be growing. I don't want to be the same pastor I was 10 years ago. I want to be better for you. I want to be better for the Lord. And as I was was thinking about, like, how long it's taken us to get to where we're at, and and as I I was thinking about, like, because it's it's hard for me not to think about the future, (laughs) And where we're going. The, the thing that, that always catches my attention is my grandfather's been in ministry for over 60 years, Michelle, a long time. Even Hope knows my grandfather, who used to, he, she's heard preach, I think, before in different places. Not here, but like back in the day. Yeah, back in the day. And, I, and I've listened to my granddad sit around with him at Thanksgiving. I drove to him with Florida a couple years ago, and I've listened to him tell me stories about God's wonder-working power. It's funny, even in the Baptist church, we sing that charismatic song. That's a charismatic song. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood, in the blood of the Lamb. (laughs) Wonder-working power. Even the Southern Baptists sing it. Come on now. There's wonder-working power. And I'd hear him talk about the wonder-working power of God that he had seen in his life, in his ministry, in his family. And Katie, you know this. Like, we've talked about it before. I've sat as a pastor, and I'm like, and as a dad, and as a husband, I'm like, "I, I want them stories. I want some stories to share. A legacy to share with my kids. You remember when God moved? And it's not that God hasn't moved in, his, in my life. He has. I recognize him. But I don't know if I've done a good enough job recognizing to where the power comes from. Maybe that's why I don't see it as often as I should. Because I'm so caught up in wanting to see something happen instead of getting caught up into someone, that being God. And so I want you to reflect. Those things that happen in your life or in someone else's life are an opportunity to point to say, where'd that come from? That's what I want you to ask this week. I want you to first think about the thing because that'll be usually the flag. That'll be the indicator to say, oh, remember when this happened? And then I want you to stop and then reflect and say, okay, now where'd that come from? Because the power comes from God. So I even gave you some examples because you're like, I don't even know where to start. So here, I gave you some examples. Here you go. Think about your salvation. Remember when you got justified? Remember when you were sitting in that service? Them are good days to remember. Remember when God saved your life? Pastor Devin was sharing with me a story about his sister who passed and how God saved her. We think about, we remember those things. Those are are stories we remember. Why? Because they point to God. I'll tell you another thing you do. You think about spiritual gifts. Me and Brett were having this conversation on the way here to church services, and he was saying, well, how, how can I know God's powerful? I was like, I'll tell you why. I said, because I know people who prophesied over my life and things happened. They don't know that, but God did. I've seen God give a 34-year-old punk like me who should know nothing counsel 70-plus-year-old people. And God give me 
a word of wisdom, supernaturally. I have no business counseling people that old, that have lived that long for me, but God give me a word of wisdom. I've seen that. I've seen God use those spiritual gifts as something that I can't do. I don't know. I don't know nothing about, but God can. And again, I don't want to get caught up in the spiritual gift more than I want to get caught up in the giver. I'll tell you another thing. Think about some healings. Maybe you know somebody or you personally experienced a healing. But remember, where'd that come from? Look at nature. This one's mine. God speaks to me primarily through nature. Not that I'm some type of tree hugger or something. I may go hug a tree if I want to, though. If it's got, like, some fruit on it. Anyways. But, uh... <laughs> But no, for sure, like when I sit out on my back porch and I'll gaze up at the stars, I know God exists. When, when I walk, this past week after my workout, I went up to the park and I just walked around. And as I was walking around the park up at Lady A, I was looking at, there was different trees and shrubbery and grass. And I was like, God, it's so cool. You got so many greens in here. There ain't, there ain't no other colors except for greens in here. And all I do is see all kinds of shades of greens. It's like, it's, like a, it's like a poor person's bridal shower. Like, you know, like your bridal party, it's like, hey, we're going to all dress green. We got all kinds of green. We got money green. We got emerald green. We got dark green. We got forest green. I see all of that, and I'm like, God, just even the diversity in the greens out here, you're amazing. I'll tell you another cool one that you can do. It's something recent that we've seen even in culture is research Webb's first deep field. Look at, look at the new pictures that they've got of these galaxy clusters and just do some research about that and tell me that, that God's not powerful. Take some time this week to reflect, to reflect on God's wonder-working power in your life. And then when you, when you catch the thing, don't forget to praise the one. I got some verses for you in Colossians 1.16 and Jeremiah 32.17. I love what Jeremiah says. He says, ah, Lord God, it is you who made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. What a like if you don't even know what to say, just say that. What a declaration to make. Ah, Lord, you're amazing. When you catch that thing of God's power and what it's done, don't forget to go to the source and praise him for his omnipotence this morning.